Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not see because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. The word of God for the people of God. Uh, let me pray for us as we go to God's word. Lord, thank you for today and this chance we have to be together in your presence. And we ask that you would once again shine your light within us. Show us ourselves. Show us yourself. Show us the pathway that draws us closer to you and give us the grace and the courage to take the next step. We ask it in your name. Amen. A few weeks ago in the Gospel of Luke, we met a certain rich ruler who came to Jesus in search of eternal life. And he seemed to be sincere when he came with his question. But when Jesus told the man that he needed to get rid of his wealth and give to the poor and follow him, the man was sad because he was very wealthy and he apparently turned away. This week, Jesus will meet another wealthy man, not only wealthy, but through dishonest and even oppressive means. Jesus has often been called the friend of sinners, but so far, it's usually meant poor, oppressed sinners. Would Jesus dare to become the friend of a rich oppressor? Could a person like that actually find eternal life? After the rich ruler left, you remember Jesus said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. What would that even look like if it happened? We're about to see an example in the story of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Jesus entered Jer Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. The first impression we get of this man is somewhat mixed. What would have jumped out at most first century readers is that he was not only a tax collector, which means he was a collaborator with Rome, Israel's oppressors, against his own people, but this guy was a chief tax collector, which meant he had probably purchased the rights to oversee many tax collectors and take a cut of everything they took in from the whole area around this large city of Jericho. No wonder he was wealthy. His whole job was extorting money for the Roman government. So this man was someone that everyone would see as a villain. But the funny thing is, his name, Zacchaeus, comes from a Hebrew word that means clean, innocent, pure. A word often associated with being righteous. It's an odd name for such an obviously immoral person. It's like Luke is kind of keeping us off balance. He's wanting us to ask, even here at the beginning, is this a good guy or is this a bad guy? Or who is this? We've already seen many times in this gospel, you can't judge a book by its cover. So what will we find with this man, Zacchaeus? Like many people in these stories, like the rich ruler from the last chapter, Zacchaeus was interested in Jesus. Verse 2. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. This is the second story in a row where the crowd of people around Jesus have been a barrier. Last week, they were the ones who rebuked the blind man, told him to stop calling out for Jesus. In this story, Zacchaeus could not see over the crowd. It's an important question we should always be asking ourselves. Are we surrounding Jesus in a way that makes it easier 
for others to get to him? Or harder? Are we creating a church that's a conduit to faith or a barrier to faith? With all the examples we find in the Gospels, I feel like we can pretty safely say that unless we are constantly and consciously trying to avoid it, the church can easily become a barrier for others without us even knowing it. So what did Zacchaeus do in order to see over this barrier? He climbed a tree. Apparently the sycamore fig tree not only grows very tall, but it usually has long horizontal branches not far from the ground, making it not only easy to climb, but easy to hang out in. So Zacchaeus climbs one that he knows about so he can get a better look at Jesus. But little does Zacchaeus know, as he is seeking after Jesus, Jesus is also seeking after him. And Jesus is about to take the initiative. Verse 5. When Zacchaeus reached the spot, or excuse me, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. This is the key turning point in the story. For whatever reason, Zacchaeus was interested in Jesus. He wanted to see him and learn more about him. But all of a sudden, he gets more than he bargained for. Jesus wants to know him. Jesus actually wants to interact with him, to spend time with him, to stay in his house, to become his friend. Jesus' approach here might be surprising to us, especially given what we know about this person. Morally speaking, spiritually speaking, Zacchaeus has a lot of issues. Issues with honesty, with corruption, maybe even fraud exploitation, materialism, he has a lot of issues. So wouldn't you think that Jesus would want to start by addressing at least one of those issues? Wouldn't you think he'd look up in the tree and say, Zacchaeus, taking people's money through coercion is wrong. You need to make a change. Or Zacchaeus, your whole life can't be about money. It's going to be empty. It's going to keep you away from God. You need to do something about that. Jesus cares about sin, right? So why doesn't he address one of those big issues? Because there's one thing that Jesus cares about even more than sin. Sinners. In fact, the only reason that Jesus cares about sin at all is because it destroys people who become ensnared in it. It's only because Jesus loves sinners so much that he's determined to do something about sin. In fact, he's on his way to Jerusalem to settle the issue once and for all. But his first love, his highest priority is people, specifically sinners. So when Jesus looks up into that tree, he sees what he wants. It's not money. It's not the title, chief tax collector. It's not just adherence to an arbitrary set of rules. Jesus didn't come just to make sure people followed rules. Jesus wants the person. He wants Zacchaeus. So that's what he tells him. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. In other words, Jesus is telling him in front of everyone, I've decided to become a friend of yours. Without Zacchaeus having to do anything, Jesus chooses to include him. That right there is the simplest form of evangelism. Just choosing to include someone in your life. It also happens to be the most Christ-like way to share faith. It's what Jesus did most often. That's what he did with the disciples. He just called them to follow him, to be with him with no prerequisites whatsoever. Remember when he called the disciples in various ways? He didn't ask them any theological questions. He didn't give them any special instructions. He just said basically, hey, you in the fishing boat, come follow me. You at the tax collector's booth, come follow me. And we've seen Jesus do that over and over again. Choose to include people, to accept them, to tell them that with him, they belong. He did it with all those children whose parents brought them to be blessed. He's done it with lepers and other people who were suffering. He's done it with lots of people who others would call world-class sinners, like the woman who came and washed his feet with her tears. And dried them with her hair. Jesus just chooses to include people. 
The first and most important way that Jesus shares faith with people is by sharing himself. And that's what he does again here with Zacchaeus. He shares himself. He offers the gift of relationship. Now what he actually does is invite himself over to Zacchaeus' house. That's a little forward, isn't it? No, it's a lot forward. In fact, it's more forward in that day even than it would be now. But I think it shows us something else about the nature of relational evangelism. When it comes to ministering to people, we usually think of it in terms of doing something for them. Helping them, serving them, giving them something. Doing something for them. But what Jesus shows us here is that another way of serving someone is allowing them to help us. Even asking for their help. Christians or not, church or not, we don't have it all figured out. We are not completely self-sufficient. We need help often and in many ways. And when we ask someone else to help us, especially if it's someone outside the church, someone who sees themselves as outside the church, that's a significant way of showing respect. It's saying, we value you. We need you. You have a unique gift to bring, and we see God in you and in your gift. I think it's the exact opposite of what we usually assume. We usually think people don't want to be bothered. Nobody wants to be asked for help. It's too much trouble. It's true that people don't want to be used. No one wants to be exploited. But all of us want to be valued. We want to be needed. I think we need to be needed to matter to someone. Asking someone to help you is a way of telling them that they matter to you. You need them. Jesus did it in all kinds of different ways. So if we want to imitate him, we need to learn to ask for help. How does Zacchaeus react when Jesus invites himself over? He loves it. Verse 6. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So Zacchaeus was overjoyed that Jesus wanted to befriend him, but the people, not so much. Again, are we surrounding Jesus in a way that makes it easier for people to get to him or harder? What Jesus wants most is people, especially sinners. Do we have that same priority? Is that what we really want? People, even and especially if they're sinners? If not, is it Jesus that we're following? So, Jesus' primary method of sharing faith is sharing himself, choosing to include people. In other words, Jesus starts with belonging. And we might ask, somewhat anxiously, wait a minute, isn't faith also about believing and behaving? Sure. But Jesus starts with belonging. And then, the believing and the behaving come next. And with Jesus, it happens pretty fast. In the very next verse, knowing Jesus being included has a pretty miraculous effect on Zacchaeus. Verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Here's the plain truth. And I know this sounds naive and simplistic, and overly optimistic. But this is the truth I think that this story is trying to show us. Love creates wholeness. Loving people makes them loving. Treating people right, even if they don't deserve it. In fact, especially if they don't deserve it. Treating people right makes them want to act right. Loving people creates wholeness. And for us, we believe that not because we believe in the innate goodness of all human beings or the power of social influence or the power of positive thinking or whatever. We believe it because we think Jesus can transform lives. We think that his love is able to change people and change the world. Loving people is the way that Jesus changes the world. And we believe that it works. 
One way we know for sure, because it's worked on us, and it continues to work on us. And it worked on Zacchaeus too, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Salvation is not a word that appears as often as we think in the Bible. It's only six times in the whole book of Luke, only 40 times in the entire New Testament. I think the modern church, at least the church I've grown up in, uses the word salvation a lot more than the Bible does. And when most Christians today use that word, we usually mean to save someone's soul from hell. That's kind of the way we tend to think about it. But when Jesus uses it here, when he says salvation has come to this house, he means that someone's life has been transformed and the world around them has been transformed. That's always what Jesus seems to mean by salvation. This guy just, not only is he not illegally and forcefully and extortively collecting money anymore, he's getting rid of it and he's giving half away and four times as much, which, which asks, makes us ask two questions. One, how much has he stolen in his lifetime? He's got a bunch of money. And two, how could the change happen so rapidly? Jesus did not say, hey Zacchaeus, why don't you get rid of your money? Hey, Zacchaeus, why are you so greedy? Never said any of those things. All he said was, I'm going to become your friend. And Zacchaeus is the one who says, well, I've got to make some changes. I've got to be different. I've got to be new. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, to transform our lives so that we can live in a way that's whole. If that was Jesus' mission then that's the mission that he calls us to continue in his name. So it should really change the way we think about sharing faith. You know what I think most of us hope for most of the time? We just wish that more people would come to church. Let's be honest. I mean, I wish all of these pews were full. We got some in the balcony. I wish those were full too. I wish we had to set up folding chairs in the narthex. I wish more people would come to church. Wouldn't that be great? If they would just come to church, then we could meet them and share our lives with them, and that would be great. What needs to happen is more people need to come to church. That's the way I think oftentimes. But here's the thing. That's not the plan that Jesus laid out for us. He didn't tell us to set up a meeting place somewhere and hope that sooner or later some people wander in and then maybe you can minister to them. He told us to go out and seek them. We're the ones that's supposed to go to them, not them come to us. How does the Great Commission start again? Therefore, go. We're supposed to be the goers. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And just as he sought us, he calls us to seek others, to include them, to let them know that they belong. On no prerequisites whatsoever, you belong. And to let his love work through us to transform the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the belonging that you give us so freely. You share your connection with the Father immediately and easily and openly with all of us. Let it do its work. Not only to give us our identity in this belonging, but to make us ambassadors of belonging. Willing to share with any and all connection with ourselves and with you. We ask it in your name. Let's go together to the Lord's table.